think I'm on now. Ms. Dunstan, how are you? Thank you for joining us tonight. I, I do apologize for the technical difficulties tonight. Um, I, I don't know exactly what happened, but we'll figure it out later. But thank you for joining with us tonight on Fort Baptist uh, with our Bible study tonight. Um, I will be teaching um, this lesson tonight on Psalms 15. I'm going to pick up where Pastor has left off. Um, he left off on Psalms 14. This week is Psalms 15. And for those who don't know who I am, I'm Reverend Derek Beeman, one of the associates, the youth, uh, young adult pastor there at the church. So we'll get started with a word of prayer and then we'll get right into the lesson. Amen. Damn it, Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this time. We thank you, Lord God, for uh, allowing us to be in the land of the living. Lord, we give you the glory and honor and praise for it all, God, and we just give you Thanks for the activity of our limbs and articulations of our speech, God. We just give you the glory for it. Thank you for everything you have done. We thank you because uh, of uh, uh, just, just, just heard in Psalms 15, God, uh, of what a, a godly person should look like. Uh, David has mentioned this in this psalm, Lord God, particularly. And God, we just give you the honor and glory for it all. And God, we, get, we thank you. In Jesus name we do pray let us all say amen. amen well Psalms 15 is tonight's lesson scripture lesson and thank you all for joining us once more keep cut. okay all right this keep it keeps cutting us off for some reason but uh David said in Psalms 15 I'm gonna read the scripture and then we're gonna just break each one of them down as I normally do uh, in Psalms 15, verse 1, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he who honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put on, put, excuse me, put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. So he who does these things shall never be moved. In one sense, uh, David's question here is, is a figurative one. Uh, who may abide in your tabernacle? In other words, who can come to the tabernacle of God? Uh, this question was a, a general question, and the remainder of the text, as we just read, is specifically in answering this question. Uh, the reason for David's question is because he, he could not go beyond the veil of God, of go beyond the veil where the tabernacle of God is because he was not a priest. And only the high priest can go beyond the veil once a year. Hebrew, Hebrews 9 and 7 says, but into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. See, the priest was only the, the, the only one, the high priest was the only people who can go beyond the veil um, to see God where the tabernacle was or the seat or the mercy seat was. And so Jesus' death on the cross ripped that veil in two for all to have access. So we all can have access to God through Jesus Christ. So, so the word abide is also translated as uh, a sojourn. It describes receiving the hospitality and of a tent dwelling host. So it also means to be under God's protection here as communion. As we mentioned communion, the Greek terminology for that word is koinonia, which we commune, come together 
to fellowship with one another. But in this case, in this case, abiding in God is communing with him, is to fellowship with him. And this is what uh, David was wanting. He wanted, he longed to fellowship with God. And once a Jew enters the home of another, they are under the care of their owner and, and they are sheltered from all harm and he wants and all his wants or he or she wants are, are met. Every all the needs that they have, everything is met. So needless to say, the guest of Jehovah is safe from their enemies and all of their needs are met. This is what David was desiring when he mentioned who can go or come to the tabernacle of God. You had to be a high priest to enter beyond the veil to be there. You had to be that. And in order to do that, you have to live. Now, the rest of the verses that we're going to, he's going to answer that question as we go along. But let's finish this, um, the, this first verse. Abide in your tabernacle. The tabernacle of God was the great tent of meaning, meeting uh, that God told Moses and Israel to build for him in Exodus 25 and 31. The seat of the, the ark in it, the, excuse me, the seat of the ark, a symbol of God's presence. That's what the tabernacle was. It was a seat of the seat of the ark and a symbol of God's presence. So, like I mentioned earlier, in the tabernacle of God, could only the high priest go beyond the veil. And David's desire was to be in God's presence. David knew this, which is why he was named a man after God's own heart. He understood that in order to be in God's presence, the heart, the mind, and the life are in step with God's heart, mind, and life. This is what he knew. And, and so in order to in order for us to, I remember I shared a devotion on Facebook and um, on my job. I sent a, a, a devotion out uh, every other day. And I mentioned in the devotion that, that we shouldn't ask for faith. We should ask more of God than God will increase our faith. And, and so when we ask for more of God, we spend, we spend time with him, God will automatically increase our faith. We should ask for more faith. We should ask for more of God. And so this is what David is longing for. He is longing for more of God. Real quick, eschatology. Eschatology, we can see this word. Now, we, we, we actually looking at the scripture in a more literal sense with David, but we can also see the eschatology part of this verse. And, and eschatology is, is the study of last things and when it comes to theology. It's the study of last things. And uh, we, can, we can talk about the end times, the rapture, and heaven. Okay, uh, We can also see the more eschatology can ask the same question today. Who can come to the tabernacle of God? Uh, we know that God reigns in heaven, but who can go there? Who can go to heaven where God is? See, in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant was the presence where God was, mm -hmm. right? In order to be there in the presence of God, you had to be a high priest to go beyond that veil. But since today, now that we are... Uh, living, we're saints of God. We live by faith and not by sight, or we not we live by faith and not by works. So who can get to heaven? And those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we have to have the heart, the mind, and the and living the life of God to get there which is part of the sanctification process when, when we're in sanctification. Um, to be sanctified, there's, there's literally three things, and I can remember right now, there's only two, two parts of sanctification. We have a positional sanctification when we give our heart to God and God changes our position from a sinner to a saint. Okay, This is positional sanctification. Progressive sanctification is where we're at right now. 
As we walking in Christ, we are being sanctified every day as we allow God to sanctify us. Uh, and you notice that it says, as we allow God to sanctify us, God has, we have to allow him by obeying his Holy Spirit who gives us strength to be able to endure these times that we're living in today. Uh, he, he guides us and guides us to all truth. He tells us what things to come. The Holy Spirit is there to help us and to comfort us. And so, and so therefore, uh, uh, when, we, when we think about that, when we think about that, uh, um, we're being sanctified. And the last, the third one, I, my memory, I, I can't recall the third um, uh, term for sanctification, is when we get to heaven and we're totally sanctified. Okay, that's where we're striving to. That's where we're trying to get where David is talking about, is getting to heaven where we can be there with him. Now, now, let's go to the second part of verse one. Who may dwell in your holy hill, David asked. Who can come to the hill of God's temple, in other words? In a sense, David here is asking the same question. You dwell is to live, is to live in the temple, live in the presence of God. David is asking who may be received as a guest into God's tent, enjoying all the protections of his hospitality, who may live as a citizen in his holy hill. When we think of the living, we are no longer a guest. When we think of living, not the living, but when we think of living, we are no longer a guest. When we live in the presence of God, that's our place of residence. That's where we want to be for the remainder of our life. We want to live uh, where we live at currently. That's our place of residence, our, our address, where we are. We want to live there and be there forever. Think about that for a moment. Think about it for a moment. I, I, when we live in the presence of God, we want to live there and that we want to be make, make sure that heaven and God is our permanent residence. Amen. Your holy hill at this time, the tabernacle of God was at Gibeon. So when we think of um, the holy hill, the, the actual place he's talking about is Gibeon. And so so when we think about that, we think about the, the, the burning bush where Moses was. Uh, um, that was considered uh, um, actually God told Moses to take your sandals off, you know, because you are in holy ground. You call that the holy hill because the old, the the. The, the, the tabernacle of God was on, a, on that tabernacle where it was sitting on was considered holy. Okay, that was a holy ground. Okay, so the, so the remaining verses describes the person who, in, who dwells in the presence. So, so now we have two questions. David asked two questions. He asked, he asked, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Asking God. Who may dwell in your holy hill? David is asking God this. And so God answers. The, the Bible actually doesn't say that God told David this, but we can actually, uh, since David is a man after God's own heart, the Spirit of God has downloaded uh, this message to answer these, that, those two questions. He says, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. Now, we're going we're gonna to break all of those down in a few minutes. But first, we're going to start with he who walks uprightly. Now, to walk uprightly is to live in a complete manner as to all parts of conduct. Uh, to live in God's path according to God's rules. That's to walk up rightly. So David is perspective. When we read the Bible, we cannot read it from a perspective of today, especially when we read the Old Testament. We have to take into account uh, um, the historical, the language, and the culture to properly interpret the word of God. So, so for those who are listening and jumping in on, on um, Facebook for the first time, joining us tonight 
Fourth Baptist who doesn't attend this church or, and you may maybe experience and want to know who God is. I, I want to share with you because this is very important. You cannot pick this up and think that this is a book that you can read off the shelf. You have to understand when you read God's word, especially in the Old Testament, it's almost like you got to go back in time to understand the historical, the language and the culture of what they do. Because if you don't, uh, uh, you will miss out on the whole message that, that, that the author is the intent of the author. You will miss out on that. And so so David, when we look at this, David, you have to think about David is speaking in his terms. He's speaking in his language. He's speaking according to his culture. And the old covenant gave an, uh, an important place to sacrifice and atone through blood. It also based uh, blessing and cursing on obedience. And the, dis the disobedience could not expect blessing, including the blessing of God's presence. So he so he he he's sharing that hey you get to walk up right and in, in order to to have their sins forgiven they had to kill an animal they had to kill an animal uh, for their sins uh, um, without the shedding of blood there will be no remission of sins and so that came from the Old Testament because they had to share their blood uh, uh, the blood of an of an ox or the blood of a goat. They had to share it, shed the blood of that and pour it all over the altar just to have their sins forgiven. But today we can see uh, Jesus, if, it, if Jesus hasn't shared his blood, uh, if Jesus didn't share his blood, there will be no remission of sin of our sin today. And see, he is the sacrifice. Back then in the Old Testament, the animals were the sacrifice. Amen. So the new covenant through the finished work of Jesus on the cross gives us the different ground of blessing and relationship with God. So having faith rather than performance is the basis for a blessing. So all we have to do now is to have faith in Jesus Christ, believe in him. Uh, we all know the scripture, John 3, 16. We not so love the world that he and whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So we know that Jesus uh, is when we have faith in him, right? Give have faith in him and that performance is the blessing, is the basis for a blessing. Amen. I, the work of righteousness. When David mentioned the work of righteousness is to do those things which are consistent with the character of God in a godly walk. Uh, the old covenant, uh, a, a righteous walk was the precondition for uh, a fellowship with God. And under the new covenant is a righteous walk is is the result of fellowship with God founded on faith. First John one and six states, if we say that we have fellowship with him. And walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Okay, so we have to walk out. We have to walk, do this walk, do have this godly walk, not just have have lip service about it. We have to have, we have to walk it out. Amen. Now, to speak truth in his heart, things which are conformity with our walk and work. And David here understood that an upright and righteous life is known by the way someone speaks. Jesus said in Matthew 12 and 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. David speaks of is to be in our heart, not lip service. OK, uh, it is it is to come from the center of our being. I believe I spoke upon, I believe I spoke this or preached this message regarding the heart. The man, I believe the title, the title of the message was um, um, that the heart of man is the soul of man. Most people believe due to we believe in Christ being or believe in God being a tribe being, being God, the father, God, the son, God, the spirit, that that we as humans are made as tribe beings. Also, that flesh soul and spirit okay some people take the that's a tra that's triconomy 
But others think that the soul and spirit are the same, which the flesh, and then you got soul and spirit, which is a dichotomy. Okay, so so therefore, uh, um, I like to uh, uh, be, I believe in the first part, which is the trichotomy. Uh, I believe that we are uh, made up in three parts. Uh, our spirit connects to God. Our soul is where our hearts and our, our, our desire comes in, where the flesh that connects us to the earth. Amen. So we have the flesh connects us to the earth. Our spirit connects us to God. And then our soul is where which we call the heart of man. And so this is where David saying in our heart, in our mind, not just lip service, but in our heart, uh, um, our soul is where the seed of our desires are. And we should guard our heart at all the times, at all times where we see what we hear. We should guard it because if we don't, uh, what enters can alter our perspective of God and how we how we would see the world around us. Amen. So 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 if we if we're not careful, we always got to guard our heart because that's where our appetites are. OK, and, and that's what needs saving. Right. Our flesh can't be saved. Our soul can or, or be or could be cleansed. Our soul can be cleansed, but our spirit needs to be saved. Amen. So so I, I, so now that we have to understand that concept, there's a concept of thought that we teach in the secular world. And on my job, we teach um, um, a course. And in that course, there's a there's three B's, which is believe, behave, become. And in that. Uh, we teach this secular model thinking is a secular thinking model that we're training lead mindset in the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. OK, so when we change in their mindset in the pursuit of happiness, um, we see the believe, behave and become. However, when I'm teaching this to leaders and since being a man of God, I can see the spiritual side of this. I can see the spiritual and and how it can work to our favor. See, believing is a source of change. Mm -hmm. This is what we teach in the secular secular world, that believing is a source of change. And if you believe it, it, it starts there. It starts with believing. Just like we believe in Jesus Christ, it starts there with the belief. That's why if you believe in him in John 3, 16 states, uh, you will have eternal life. So you have to believe in God. So believe is the source of change. And when we believe in God and his word, and his word and trust his word, it changes us. It changes us internally by cleansing our heart, right? It cleanses our heart uh, um, to the point where outwardly we start to behave different. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you see that? See how that works? See, so when we believe in God, it God's word will cleanse our heart to where we can start behaving differently. And then when we continue to behave in that fashion, we'll become what God wants us to be. Amen. Amen. So this is how we, I can see what we teach in the secular world. Uh, um, I can see that for an advantage for believers, how we can believe, which is the source of change, as we believe and believe in God, believe in his word. It changes us internally with our heart. And then it changes those desires, may not come completely, but it cleanses us. Uh, it cleanses us from that. And then we can continue to live like that. We start to be, you know, well, we behave in a manner. And then once we behave this way and continue in that behavior of living, then we, we and, and the result, become what God wants us to be. Amen. So, so this is what David was saying, that the truth, we must speak the truth in his heart or in our hearts. We must speak that truth. Okay. Now, he who does not backbite with his tongue. Okay, you guys might get ready to log off when I when we talk about this one. Okay, y'all might want to scroll up. Uh, y'all gonna go ahead. So 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 this one is a this is very good right here. The backbite. Uh, he does does not backbite with his tongue. Now the term backbite is he never slanders nor gossip. 
The reason why people leave the church. Look, don't don't kick me out of church on Sunday, okay? Y'all y'all love on me when I say this, okay? The reason why people leave the church is because of gossip, criticism, and slander. I'm gonna say that one more time. The reason why people leave the church is because of gossip, criticism, and slander. Uh, um, I wish somebody can type in the chat and say, in other words, church hurt. Okay, they leave. That's what church hurt. So backbite is more relevant in our uh, than than any than any other single sin in the church. Backbite. We wound our brothers and sisters when we backbite. Okay, uh, James said in chapter three, and I'm always gonna give you what the word of God says. Uh, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so, is so set among our members that it defiles the whole the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Yeah, yeah, we that's this is why we need the Holy Spirit to help us to tame our tongue. Right. To help us. Uh, to to speak right to to love our neighbors because the whole the whole piece to this is uh, we shouldn't be backbiting against one another. It's, we already are dealing with persecution of the church from the world. We are already dealing with the world and fighting against them, trying to tell them about Christ. But then when we get to but in the church, we shouldn't be doing that in the body of Christ. We should love on one another uh, in the body of Christ. So when we check a person, the first statement they use is, well, you know, you know, God ain't through with me yet. God is working on all of us. Uh, uh, what makes you think you can get a pass for gossip, slander, and criticism? What makes you think that? Uh, uh, we shall... We, we all should be striving to be better in God. We shall all be striving to be better in God, not hiding behind excuses so we can continue to slander. Uh, that, that should not be. Uh, and when we get interesting, and then I'm going to move on from here. Adam Clark wrote this statement regarding the backbite. He says this, the person who backbites, he is a knave. Okay, knave, hyphen, dishonest hyphen, good-for-nothing person who will rob you of your good name. They are cowards. They will speak of you in your absence uh, uh, what he dared not to do in your presence. Whew. Gracious. And only an ill-conditioned dog will fly at and bite your back when your face was turned. This is this is evil to this is like uh, um, doing evil to your neighbor, which is the next portion that we're talking about. Uh, 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 so, so if you ain't got look, if you ain't got the courage to stand there and say something to the person face, uh, uh, don't don't do the backbite because you're gonna. It, it's like it, like my like Adam Clark says. He said you're they are cowards, and and you'll speak of a person in their absence. Versus being in their presence and you're like a, a ill-conditioned dog, you know, you, that means you're, you, you're happy when, when you're looking at and the dog's looking at you. It, it's, it's all great. And but as soon as you turn your back, the dog bites you on your heel or it bites you on your calf muscle or whatever. It bites you. And because 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 technically you're no longer a threat to the dog facing the dog, you're a threat. But when you turn your back, you're no longer a threat. That's why 
We can't shoot people in the back and in a and in America because when a person turns away, that's what that's what he's saying. On a backbiting, okay? Backbiting will uh, will cause some church hurt. Okay, moving on. Noah does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. So David also knew that righteousness is expressed in the way we treat one another. He knew this. Again, we're talking about a man after God's own heart here. Okay. The word reproach means to disgrace or shame. Reproach. To disgrace or or shame. We should not disgrace or shame our brethren when they commit a sin. <laughs> Miss Julia said, watch it back. <laughs> okay. Uh, we should not disgrace or shame our brethren when they commit a sin. Galatians 6 and 1 states, see, Paul was, when he wrote these 13 letters in the New Testament to the saints in these areas in Corinth, in Corinth, in Galatia, and uh, 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 in Thessalonica and Rome, he was writing to them to, to kind of set order for the saints and teaching them how they should behave in the church or with the body. And he shared with them in Galatia, he said, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves least, you also be tempted. So, so, so we have to be careful uh, uh, um, when we see our brother fall into sin, we have to restore them. One of the things I've noticed in church today, we do, we do great at shaming and pointing the finger at somebody else's sin, but we, we lack restoring the brother back to God. We lack that. We lack the love and the luster to bring the person back to God, to restore them uh, um, to God. Amen. Uh, case in point. Here it is. Here's an example from the Bible. Last week, I sent a devotion. I sent another one regarding the resurrected Christ when he was cooking breakfast uh, 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 with the disciples in John ch chapter 21. Now, prior to Jesus' crucifixion, G Peter denied Christ three times. He denied him three times. When people realized that he was one of the ones hanging around uh, or following Jesus. I recall in scripture, there was nowhere in scripture where Jesus, I'm trying to reconnect here. I recall there was nowhere in scripture where Jesus shamed him for doing that. What he did do was tell them, hey, Drop your nets on the other side of the ship or on the side of the boat and catch you some fish over there. Matter of fact, and when you catch it, bring it all over here to us so we can have breakfast. That's all he said. He didn't shame Peter. He told Peter at the, at, at the table before he was crucified, the night that he was betrayed, he told them that Peter said, Peter told, well, he told Peter that this is what you're going to do. Now I follow you to the ends of the earth, Look, Peter. <laughs> Before the crop goes twice, you're going to deny me three times. He told him that. When he did it, Jesus didn't put shame on him. Peter was already feeling the shame because he remembered what Christ shared with him at the table. Like, oh man, I just did that. Yeah. Oh man. Then he runs off and he cried. He wept. Because then the shame filled his heart. Okay. So Jesus didn't kick him down because he did that. Uh, um, he, he pretty much encouraged him uh, um, at that time when he was eating breakfast. That day. He said, he said, Peter, do you, no, excuse me, he didn't love me. He said, did you love me? He said, yeah, feed my sheep. And so that's what he commanded him to do. And so he commanded Peter in that chapter to feed his sheep. There was no need to shame Peter because he was already filled with the shame. Uh, and so what the church does, does well is that we, again, we shame, person, shame a person for their sin, but we lack restoring a person back to the gentleness. So, so, so nor does evil to his person, nor does he take, take up a reproach or nor does he take up a 
or disgrace against his friend or so so in other words uh in other words of david uh we we also see the deeper work of christ uh, who commands us not to only love uh, our neighbor and friend but, uh, as well all right verses four and five uh this this really is going to so so let me back up a little bit the what we just read those verses is regarding our brothers in Christ, our friends and neighbors. So two and three are regarding how we interact with the character among our friends and neighbors. Okay. Four and five is a character among difficult people. And in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he who honors those who fear the Lord but he, he who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he who does not put out his money as usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. So let's talk about the first one. In whose eyes a vile person, which is a reprobate or unprincipled person, is despised. I'm reminded of Proverbs 25, 28, when it says, whoever has rule of his own spirit, no, excuse me, who, whoever has no rule of his own spirit is like a city. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whoever has no rule of his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. So David knew that we cannot love good unless we also oppose evil. As it says in Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Yet the righteous man also honors those who fear the Lord. He makes his judgments about men on a godly basis. Uh, corruption. Okay. So, so, so we have to, uh, um, we, in the eyes of a veiled person, we, we despise those people. Okay. Because when they, those folks, all they think about is evil. Okay. Honors those who fear the Lord. We must be honest in paying respect as in paying our bills. Okay. Honor to him, honor is due. Okay. We just pay honor to our brethren. To all good men, we owe a debt of honor. And we have no right to hand over what is their due to vow persons who happen to be in high places. That's quote from Spurgeon. Who, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. The man who holds his oath, he is made. He holds on to his hope. Oh, uh, even though some may cause him harm, those oaths that he, he promised uh, may cause him harm, he does not change from them. He doesn't change from them. He, even though he's, he's going to stick to it. The idea is, even when it no longer is uh, with no longer uh, to his advantage to do so. Yeah. This next one is very interesting. Um, and and we, we write it closing here. He does not put out his money as usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Mm. So so David describes the man who wants to live a righteous life when it comes to money. Uh, many people uh, who who be who would be considered godly in other areas of their lives still have not decided to use their money uh, in in a way that honors God or show shows love and care to others. So usury uh, was prohibited for Israel. Uh, it, it was uh, because those who normally borrow money were were in a financial difficulty. Um, this pretty much saying that within the body of, of the Jews, when they get loans, um, the person couldn't charge them interest. They couldn't charge them interest within the Jew, Jewish community. If they outside of the Jewish community, they could charge them interest because they're like Gentiles. So they can charge them uh, interest. But if you're in the body of the Jews, you couldn't charge each other interest because uh, um, because the person couldn't afford it. It was already, they come to them to get a loan for a financial difficulty because they couldn't afford it. 
So you couldn't charge them interest. So it was but to, to, it was law to, to charge interest. Interest. And so the rich and the powerful was warned by prophets not to exploit the poor. Uh, 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 we charge more money. Uh, um, well, we can see it today. Uh, the world will charge, uh, will try to exploit the poor. Well, 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 in the Jewish culture, the the rich and the powerful, the prophets warned them, hey, rich, powerful, you can't exploit the poor just because you got it all. Um, technically, it should be used in a way to help them um, who are poor. Um, but that is the Jewish culture. So so this is why he, he mentioned that he who does not put out his money at usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Because this is something that they did, then it was totally against the law. And then lastly, we come to the last verse and the last portion of, of five is, he who does these things should never be moved. Uh, the blessing that comes from this character. So, so the idea behind shall never be moved is that this righteous one will be a guest in the tent of God forever. The New Testament words, we could express it like, it's like, and the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he, do, he who does the will of God abides forever. That's John, 1 John 2, verse 17. And so that's why you, you won't be moved. When we do the will of God, we will, we should not be moved because we're doing the, the, the will of God. God will protect us because we're in his presence. Uh, that's where we want to be. That's where David wants to be. He longs to be there, but he couldn't at that time because the high priest was the only ones to go beyond the veil. So he was like, oh, well, well who can go there? God, God, who can be in your presence? Who really? Who can? Okay. So in summary, David's concern here is with the totality of life determined by the character of God. Uh, this includes right speech with our neighbor and integrity. So oaths are to stand. Money, uh, the innocent are to, to be protected. We, we see these standards fulfilled in Christ and then fulfilled in us who abide in him and walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, Romans 8, 4. Uh, Jesus is the one in whom there is no sin, 1 Peter 2, 22. And he is the one who manifests the righteousness of God first for us and second in us, 2 Peter 2 and 24. So then David couldn't get beyond there because the Holy Spirit was made available to David and those who are in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Today, Jesus allowed, Jesus made the Holy Spirit available to us so that we can live for him and we can develop this character so that we can be in the presence of God. I challenge everyone every day. And I know, I know one of the biggest ones, the biggest takeaway from this message is that backbite, uh, that's the biggest one. Uh, I thought it was the biggest uh, takeaway from this message myself. Um, because we we lack um, we, we we like to do a lot of gossip and criticism and slander. Um, uh, we see it on our jobs. We see it in our in our families. We see it all the time. And 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 due to the fact that um, it, we 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 pass it over as something that's not uh, it's just something minute. But uh, but God is not looking at it as a small thing. This is just as this is much of a sin as as something as as someone watching pornography or um someone who is uh, um who who is abusing alcohol and uh, um someone who is fornicating or committing adultery see we look at all of those as huge uh big sin but this one right here the backbite part is a, is a sin where 
where we, we do every day and don't even realize it because we're so comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so we have to allow God to retrain our hearts and cleanse our hearts from backbiting and for doing these things so that we can be what David wanted to be, what God had answered David with those two questions. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? And then, then it's like God speaking through David of what what type of person is, what who can and who can't. Uh, so I mean, God really just answered both of those questions in those next two verses. So uh, I think you sharing with with me tonight and before we before we depart i i will close in prayer i will ask um uh, i will ask is there any questions but um but since we're on live tonight uh we'll just open up and i just close in prayer and then i'll give you back the rest of your evening amen amen let us pray dear heavenly father we thank you for this time god we give you the glory and honor and praise for it God, we just learned about Psalms 15, about the character of a man, that David really, it was a psalm of David, and David really wanted to be in your presence. And so, God, he asked those two questions, who can dwell in your tabernacle, who can dwell, who can come to your holy hill? And God, we realize and we just dissect the verses in this chapter and, and notice that you you provided David with uh, who, who, who can't. God, help us to be exactly what you said to David regarding of who can be in your presence. God, help us to live right, to walk up rightly, to speak the truth in our heart, God. Help us to do those things, God, and to be a light and beacon amongst others. Uh, um, the only Jesus that people is going to see is going to see in us. And so, God, help us to be that sh that light that to show Jesus from amongst us, Lord. Cleanse our hearts, Lord God. Uh, um, uh, um, we understand some of us will use that term that I'm a work in progress, God, and, I, and you know, you know, God ain't you ain't through with me yet. And so, God, help us uh, uh, to be better. Uh, uh, once we learn and understand Your Word, Lord, we we we're pretty much held accountable by Your Spirit uh, to do right. And so, God, help us walk up right, talk right. Uh, um, and, and do this, Lord God, for so that others can be influenced by you through us. And so, God, as we leave this place for natural presence, God, we thank you for this lesson tonight. We thank you for everyone that chimed in um, to, to watch and to hear the word of God being taught tonight in Psalms 15. And we pray, Lord God, that you would just bless them. Bless them from the crown of the head to the soles of the feet. Bless our pastor that was not been able to, to do this tonight. But God, we just give you the glory for him and his wife. Thank you for the rest of the Fourth Baptist Church, uh, uh, those who are who have supported this event. And God, we just give you the glory and honor for all the things you, you have done. Thank you for life, health, and strength. And we give you the praise and honor. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for, for, again, for sharing with us tonight. And God bless each and every one of you. And until we meet again, God bless you.